Faye, it feels really nice to be back and recording podcasts again after parental leave. But, you know, even six weeks later, I feel like I have missed a whole world of things in OBGYN. Yeah, me too, especially nine weeks out. But thankfully for us, um, we can refresh our memory with the OBG project. That's right. The OBG project kind of has their great, great summaries in these bullet point formats online. They've got resident exclusive resources, the core curriculum, um, and they've got a new project in the primary care med project. Um, you can check that out as well, which lets you get up to date with all those primary care guidelines that we got to keep up with too. And even better, if you're a resident, remember that you can get OBG first absolutely free. So if you want to figure out how to do that, go ahead and go onto our website, click on the sidebar, and link to the OBG project. All right, guys, welcome back. This is Faye. This is Nick. And this is... Kriogs over coffee. All right. So we are back, guys, after our hiatus. Um, we are still a little bit sleep deprived uh, with our newborns, but we are back to talk to you about impacted fetal head during cesarean delivery. So, Nick, what are our learning objectives? Yes, fortunately, something I'm happy to say neither you or my wife had to deal with Yes, <laughs> <laughs> as a personal thing, but something that in our lives working as obstetricians, we've obviously had to deal with. So um, from a learning objective perspective today, first, we're going to talk about identification of the impacted fetal head. Next, we'll review what risk factors are associated with the impacted fetal head. And then finally, we'll discuss management of impacted fetal head. Um, and today's kind of co-reading, if you will, come from the Saskog Pearls of Excellence. If you're not familiar with the Pearls of Excellence, they're really, really great. Again, published by Saskog. There are a number of topics, but they have one on cesarean delivery with a deeply impacted fetal head. We'll link to that on our website. All right, so Faye, we obviously have seen this before. We talked about we've seen this before. Um, you can kind of just imagine the scenario in your head, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you as a resident, you're called to do an urgency section for a patient with an arrest of second stage of labor. And per the sign out from your co-resident, that patient's been pushing for almost three hours. The fetal station has never made it below plus one. And so, you know, an operative delivery was not possible. And, uh, you know, your co-resident tells you that there is significant caput. So knowing all of this, you know, what are some of the things that you should be thinking about, hopefully to make the C-section a little bit easier for yourself and the rest of the team? And the answer really is, what are some of the things that we can do to facilitate delivering a potentially impacted fetal head because this person's been pushing for three hours? Um, so let's go through that, Nick. How do I identify an impacted fetal head? Uh, you know, you might think that it's self-explanatory, um, but surprisingly enough, varying definitions have been proposed for what exactly constitutes an impacted fetal head. Essentially, these definitions all center on having the fetal head being deeply engaged within the pelvis, resulting in you know, some definition of a quote-unquote difficult extraction. This is a complication of about 1.5% of cesarean births, um, but up to 25% of emergent cesarean births. Again, recognizing that this is something that tends to impact those kind of deep second stage arrests, if you will. In terms of risk factors for this, no, one of the big ones is fetal malposition, which can lead to that second stage arrest situation, right? You have those occiput posterior or occiput transverse positions. And if you think back to when we talked about pelvimetry, recall OP positioning kind of leads to that larger occipitofrontal diameter. So that kind of distance between the back of the head to the front of the head. And that in diameter is 11 and a half centimeters on average. So really kind of on the large side, whereas if you're passing through the pelvic outlet in an occiput anterior position, that diameter only comes out to about nine and a half centimeters. Um, so again, that makes a big, big difference in terms of kind of dropping through there, particularly if the pelvis is not the most roomy. Um, if you don't remember all of that talk about pelvimetry, not to fret, we did talk about it a long time ago on the podcast and malpresentation and malposition. Um, we'll link to that again on the website. 
Other risk factors can include things like a prolonged second stage for any other kind of reason, um, a patient who has a failed operative vaginal delivery, so you're converting to cesarean delivery after it failing to attempt forceps or a vacuum. Um, and then really, you know, if you can think about anything else where a head might get wedged into the pelvis for some reason, that is essentially the risk factor there. So that's, that's the way that kind of you should think about it is like, okay, I need to be prepped and ready for this. Um, you no, know, speaking of prepped and ready for this, Faye, though, like, is there a way that like before I put scalpel on to start this c-section i can know whether this head is going to be tough to extract yeah so unfortunately there's not a 100 percent way of identifying that a fetal head will be impacted before you actually do that c-section and you reach down into the pelvis um, but you should suspect that there could be an impacted fetal head if there are any of the above risk factors that you mentioned nick um, and then, you know, regarding how you can kind of identify some of these things with regards to fetal position, you can know this by palpating the sutures. And so in babies that are OP, that posterior fontanelle um, will usually be felt first. And this feels triangular as it's formed by the junction of the sagittal and the lamboidal sutures. And this is going to be in contrast to babies who are OA, where, you know, you're going to feel that anterior fontanelle likely first. And this is going to be shaped like a diamond. Other methods for identifying fetal position is using transabdominal ultrasonography to figure out position um, because the rate of error for digital vaginal exams can range anywhere from 30 to 65% depending on the study. And you can imagine this is always user dependent, right? Like some people are just very good at identifying position digitally and some people may not be. Usually, um, an impacted fetal head is only going to be able to be identified 100% for sure even if you suspect it, during the actual C-section. So when you place a hand beneath the pubic bone, you go to lift that fetal head, it's often very difficult due to how low the head is. So either one, you probably can't get that hand around the fetal head to elevate it, or two, it's difficult to elevate and flex the head because of the position or how low that head is. All right, so knowing that then, Nick, before we kind of get into how we would manage all of this stuff, why do we actually care if the head is impacted? Well, you know, there kind of we can break this up, I guess, into a couple of different categories of risks, right? We we tend to do this in our clinical thinking in saying what are the risks to mom and what are the risks to the baby. No, from a maternal risk perspective, no, obviously it's going to be hard to elevate the head and deliver the baby. But for maternal risks, you know, you think about those second stage C sections where the lower uterine segment tends to be really thin. You're already dealing with a uterus that's pretty tired overall. If you're kind of thinking back to our episodes on postpartum hemorrhage and stuff, your, your mind should be going crazy right now of like, oh yes, this is a setup for a bad hemorrhage. And so one of the major increased risks for an impacted head to mom is hemorrhage from you no know, just atony or routine postpartum hemorrhage. Another place where you can have significant hemorrhage is because of a hysterotomy extension. Again, that lower uterine segment is really, really thin, so it's easy to tear, particularly kind of towards your broad ligament, towards your uterine vessels, um, or downwards towards the cervix and even as low as the vagina sometimes. So um, kind of those extensions can be challenging and tend to bleed quite a bit. And then if you have extensions going to places that you don't want to be, you end up potentially injuring other structures in that neighborhood, right? So if you're extending downwards and you're trying to pull up little bits of tissue paper of the mm -hmm. lower uterine segment, you might grab your bladder and boom, you have a bladder injury. If you're out particularly lateral, this is one of those times where potentially you might grab a ureter at the time of C-section, which is an unusual injury at C-section, as we talked about in our injuries podcast before. Um, but this is the time that that can happen. So um, again, not a fun situation for maternal risk at all. In terms of risk to the baby, um, you might suspect already the risk for traumatic injury, right? If you are listening to this podcast and you've done a C-section or you've tried to do, as we'll talk about techniques later, but if you've tried to extract a fetal head from a sort of pulling up technique, um, you know that sort of ping pong ball feel that kind of feels kind of creepy when you're pushing on the skull, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, those traumatic injuries, though, are substantiated and they do occur with an impacted head. And again, the longer that you're having difficulty with the 
extraction and the uterus is trying to contract, the placenta may be separating and leading to things like neonatal hypoxia um, that then can result obviously in those other issues down the line of like profound respiratory acidosis and sometimes even metabolic acidosis if it's allowed to progress too far. Again, we want to identify this and try to anticipate what we should do in advance to be able to resolve the impacted head. So thinking about that, Faye, let's get into the scenario. We're there, we're in this C-section, um, and we suspect an impacted head. What are we doing? Yeah, so like any other obstetric issue, like you're thinking, you know, there's going to be a shoulder dystocia, everything like that, let others know what you're thinking. So tell your nursing staff, let your charge nurse know, tell anesthesia, and let neonatology know. And this way, everyone is prepared. The second thing is to call for help if needed. So if you need another team member to come in for assistance, it's always better to call them, let them know what's happening, have them there and not need them than, you know, in that emergent uh, time period where you're actually trying to get that head up to then call out overhead because that's going to take way longer for somebody else to come in to help you. So let people know and call for help. The other thing to do is position your patient accordingly. Your success as a surgeon is always going to depend on, first of all, your positioning of the patient and also your assistance. So we tend to favor positioning patients where we think there's going to be an impacted fetal head in a modified lithotomy position. So you can either frog leg the patient on the bed if you don't have the ability to drop that bottom part of the operating uh, room table, or you can place them in lithotomy, but bend the legs down so that the hip joint is not flexed during the initial part of the case so that you're able to do the initial part with your fan and steel, et cetera, because sometimes it's hard to do that your fan and steel and, you know, put in the bladder blade and things like that when the hips are actually flexed. So you can use your yellow fin stirrups. And then, you know, if you do identify that there is an impacted fetal head, then it's easy to then flex the hip joints into dorsal lithotomy um, if you need to. And then the Next thing is to place your hysterotomy accordingly. So especially if that patient has entered the second stage, we know that that lower uterine segment is going to be very distended and very thin. Kind of like you talked about, Nick, you're going to get that like tissue paper mm -hmm. tish down there, right? So the hysterotomy actually should be placed relatively high, higher than you think to avoid inadvertent entry into the cervix or vagina. And of course, to try and avoid things like a bladder injury, especially if you think that there might be extension. So go higher than you normally would in someone who is not been pushing, someone who has not been laboring. All right, so these are kind of the things to come up in preparation um, when we suspect an impacted fetal head. But now let's say we're actually in the thick of it. What are some of the maneuvers that we can do, Nick, to resolve uh, that impacted fetal head? Yeah, let's talk about first the kind of two that I think most people will be familiar with before we get into some of the less common things. Um, the first that probably, or that I trained with, or we trained with, I should say, Faye, um, yep. more commonly is probably what's known as the vaginal hand or the push technique. Um, and this is as it sounds like, somebody wears kind of a sterile glove and inserts a hand into the vagina with the goal ultimately to elevate and displace the fetal head. Um, they shouldn't remove their hand until the head has been disimpacted by the surgeon from above or if it's deemed that that method has failed. Again, kind of this is just very straightforward. You're replacing the fetal head. Um, and if you've ever kind of thought about in your minds the idea of like a Zavinelli maneuver for mm -hmm. a shoulder dystocia, this is sort of what that's like on a lighter scale, right? You're just kind of, again, pushing the head back up through the canal and getting the surgeon to kind of scoop the head from there to lift up and out. Um, the other that may be familiar to other folks, depending on where you practice and how you've trained, is the breech delivery technique or what's also called the pull technique, in which case you sort of abandon the idea of delivering head first. And instead of going down for the head, you reach up for the feet to deliver the baby breech. Um, you extract the feet from the hysterotomy, you deliver the rest of the fetus, and some folks may think, huh, that sounds kind of funny, why would I reach up and do that? But actually there are some studies in low resource settings that demonstrate that the pull technique results in decreased maternal hemorrhage, decreased hysterotomy extensions, and decreased infection when compared to the push technique. Again, limitations to those studies, um, but we'll post kind of on our website a comparison via systematic review and meta-analysis demonstrating this. That way you can take a look at some of the studies and the quality for yourselves. Um, but either one of these techniques are probably what most of us are training with is sort of your first line in terms of how you manage this situation. 
The next one up is the idea of extending your hysterotomy. And this is something that potentially no sort of, gosh, the vaginal hand didn't work, or I don't have enough room to affect a breech delivery. And so you're looking to kind of just buy some additional room to maneuver. You come up on the lateral side of your hysterotomy upwards, or you make a T shape where you move from the center of your hysterotomy and cut upwards. In order to do this, you need to place two fingers beneath the area that you want to extend to help protect the baby, kind of pull the uterus towards yourself, and then cut the uterus in that shape with bandage scissors. This certainly is going to lead to more bleeding and is going to be a more challenging hysterotomy to repair, um, but may, again, ultimately buy you the time that you need, or the space, I should say, that you need in order to affect delivery and improve outcomes. All right, Faye, let's move to some kind of more uh, unusual techniques or things that folks may not be seeing in routine practice because they're either newer or just haven't been really that well described. Yeah, so, you know, the other thing that we can think about are devices. And there have been devices that have been created. The most well known is probably the fetal disimpacting system or cephalic elevation device. I think on the market, it's known as the fetal pillow. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, we're really not getting paid by them at all, but we just wanted to mention it. So, this is basically an inflatable device that's placed into the vagina that then elevates the fetal head. Um, there has been one randomized controlled trial at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston that showed that this device led to a 23 second reduction from hysterotomy to delivery compared with other methods. So uh, basically patients all received the device that was placed in the vagina, but they were randomized to either having the device inflated or not inflated. Um, one thing to think about though, is we do have to think about the fact that this is a device. And so all medical devices are going to cost a certain amount of money. There is an argument by the company that, you know, by using this device that potentially you are also decreasing the amount of hemorrhage and potentially decreasing the cost of transfusing your patient. So certainly some things to think about. The other techniques that we can also consider um, are things that have been described, but these are not as well studied as the push or pull technique. So one is called the shoulder first method, where the shoulders are initially delivered through the hysterotomy, followed by traction placed on the axilla, um, basically in the armpits to facilitate delivery of the body and subsequently the head. Um, this is actually known as the Padwarden maneuver, and apparently it sounds like they love to do this at the University of Washington. Um, so that's another one that, you know, we wanted to throw out there. And then, you know, for me, otherwise, I really haven't done anything else other than the push and pull and extending the hysterotomy, Nick, but any other ones that you've tried to uh, help disimpact a fetal head? Yeah, no, I did have to make that shout out because I learned about the Pedward maneuver for the first time while at UW. I'd never seen it done. Um, and I have to admit, it's something that still kind of strikes me that it works. Um, definitely, we'll link to a YouTube video on our website that you can kind of take a look at this because it, it kind of strains credulity if you hear like, gosh, I'm going to deliver the shoulders first and then flip the baby out after that. But but it works. Um, I haven't tried it. I've only tried that like once or twice, but as we've described, you no, know, I think you no, know, these common things are the things that I've tried as well. All right. And so just some last thoughts here. So again, if an impacted fetal head occurs and it's particularly difficult, especially if it leads to things like a need for multiple maneuvers, remember to debrief. So both with your team, um, what happened, what went well, what could have been improved and some take-home points. And again, for full description on how to debrief, check out our episode on debriefing, which we'll post on our website. And then the last thing is to debrief or talk to your patient, because often this can be a very traumatic delivery for both the provider and the patient. First of all, the baby may need to go to the NICU. There may need to be a hysterotomy extension. And so really you want to talk to your patient about what happened and discuss, you know, if maneuvers resulted in certain complications like extensions, baby going to the NICU, and if there's a need for future C-sections, if for example, you needed to do a T incision. All right, Nick, I think that kind of sums up everything that we wanted to talk about today. So let's go ahead and summarize. Sure. So again, we talked first about identifying the impacted fetal head. There's been a lot of different definitions proposed, but they center on basically this idea of the fetal head being deeply engaged within the pelvis, resulting in a difficult extraction. Risk factors for this include malposition, like OP or OT kind of presentations, prolonged second stage, failed operative delivery, anything where the head gets wedged into the pelvis. There's no 
hundred percent certain way of identifying that the fetal head is going to be impacted before you do a C-section, but you should suspect it with any of those risk factors in particular. Um, and again, that kind of, you can prep yourself by trying to understand the fetal position before you get into the operating room. Um, oftentimes we don't identify this again until doing the C-section. Um, and when you try to kind of get your hand beneath that pubic bone, it's difficult because the head is so, so low. And then the reason we care about impacted fetal head is that it causes risk to mom, things like maternal hemorrhage, hysterotomy extensions, and bladder injuries, etc. And it also causes things like neonatal hypoxia and possibly even traumatic injuries to the baby, depending on how impacted that head is. So it's really important to identify the impacted fetal head and anticipate how to resolve it. Once you're there and you suspect that you have an impacted fetal head, again, first thing to do is speak out loud. Let others know what you're thinking. Tell your nursing staff, anesthesia, neonatology. Get everyone prepared and call for help if you need it. You want to be able to position the patient accordingly. Ideally, you do this in advance if you're anticipating it, um, where you can either frog leg the patient or place them in lithotomy um, as a quote-unquote just-in-case using yellowfin stirrups. Again, something where they kind of start where they're more in a modified lithotomy position and can be moved quickly to a dorsal lithotomy position. And then finally, plan your hysterotomy accordingly, especially if the patient's in the second stage, that lower uterine segment is so thin, so distended, be sure to place that hysterotomy much, much higher than you ordinarily would to avoid inadvertent entry to the cervix of the vagina. In terms of how to resolve an impacted fetal head, there are a, a few techniques that we'll talk about. We first talked about the vaginal hand or the push technique, where basically someone wears sterile gloves and inserts a hand into the vagina to elevate the fetal head. Then there's the breech delivery or pull technique, where essentially the surgeon will extract the baby's feet from the hysterotomy first and proceed to deliver the rest of the fetus. There are studies that show that potentially this technique can lead to less maternal hemorrhage, hysterotomy extensions, and infections compared to the push technique. Other methods include things like extending the hysterotomy with a J or a T and which unfortunately, while this may be needed to get the baby out, can lead to a longer case and more bleeding. And then we also talked about things like devices, like the fetal disimpacting system that can be used, as well as other techniques like the Pedwarden maneuver. Um, in terms of kind of closing thoughts, remember that if you have an impacted fetal head and it's particularly difficult, debrief with your team um, and also debrief with the patient. This can be a traumatic experience for everybody involved, um, but it's important that, again, we debrief with our team, talk to the patient, particularly if there are any complications that occur um, and if there's need for planning regarding future delivery. All right, Faye, well, I think that does it for our show on the impacted fetal head. Once again, this is Nick. This is Faye. And this has been Creogs Over Coffee. So guys, if you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, go ahead and go into your favorite podcatcher, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. Give us a five-star rating and review. You can find us online on Twitter slash X at Creogs Over Coffee, on Facebook at Creogs Over Coffee, um, on Instagram at Creogs Over Coffee, or if you love the show and want to support us, head over to patreon.com slash Creogs Over Coffee. Send us some love and we'll send you some swag. You can find show notes for this episode and all of our other episodes on our website, which is at www.creogsovercoffee.com. And finally, if you have questions for us, a uh, correction to this or any of our prior episodes, or just want to say hello, email creogsovercoffee at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.